Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of Dune, or Dune, House of Trades by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. So, um, this is the first of the books that Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson wrote after Frank Herbert's passing. I've heard a lot of bad things about the continuation of the Dune series. Uh, we will find out later whether I think that is justified. I will say, because it's a long old book, I mean, it's about... 700 pages in pretty small print um, so I'm going to be reviewing this in stages like I'll come back each day and give you my updates on it um, check out all my tabs I'm going to share the blurb for you now and then at the end I'll share an overall rating so Dane reads Frank Herbert's award-winning Dune Chronicles captured the imagination of millions of readers worldwide. By his death in 1986, Herbert had completed six novels in the series, but much of his vision remained unwritten. Now, working from his father's recently discovered files, Brian Herbert and best-selling novelist Kevin J. Anderson collaborate on a new novel, The Prelude to Dune, where we step onto the planet Arrakis, decades before Dune's hero, Paul Mwadib Atreides, walks its sands. Here is the rich and complex world that Frank Herbert created in the time leading up to the momentous events of Dune. As Emperor Elrude's son plots a subtle regicide, young Leto Atreides leaves for a year's education on the mechanised world of Ix. A planetologist named Pardo Kynes seeks the secrets of Arrakis, and the eight-year-old slave Duncan Idaho is hunted by his cruel master in a terrifying game from which he vows escape and vengeance. But none can envision the fate in store for them, one that will make them renegades and shapers of history. So. Right off the bat, obviously, we've got a lot of interesting characters here. Um, I never much liked Paul Atreides, so I always enjoy, I always liked Leto more, and then Leto the Second or whatever, uh, whatever he was called, from God Emperor of Dune. So it's kind of interesting from that uh, angle. I also really enjoyed Duncan Idaho as a character, so it was good to get that as well. So near the beginning, we get this line: "On the Imperial planet Kaitan, immense buildings kiss the sky," and I wonder if that's a nod to Purple Haze by Jimi Hendrix. I should also mention as well, uh, I've not read Brian Herbert before, I have read Kevin J. Anderson before because he did some of the Star Wars novelizations. So I do kind of respect him uh, as a writer. Uh, we get a play happening uh, where we get the line, Suffering is the great teacher of men. And all of the chapters in this are sort of, uh, as with the original Dune novels, begin with like quotations from various, you know, fictional books from the Dune universe. And this one begins with the line, Thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of a human mind. Chief commandment resulting from the Butlerian Jihad found in the Orange Catholic Bible. And get this great little bit here. Uh, so in the play, when the returning general went to his bath, his treacherous wife tangled him in purple robes and stabbed both him and his oracular mistress to death. My gods, a deadly blow has befallen me, Agamemnon wailed from off stage, out of sight. Old Paula smirked and bent over to his son. I've killed many a man in the battlefield. Now I've yet to hear one say that as he died. And then one of the Harkonnens uh, goes worm hunting, basically. Um, and he blows one up and, and uh, we get this Fremen dude. Um, I don't know. Is he a Fremen? Thekar. Shia Halud, he whispered. Then he turned to Kynes as if sensing a kindred spirit. This is an ancient one. One of the oldest of the worms. And then... It basically dissolves as soon as it's dead, which I thought was interesting. And we get this um, about uh, Leto's parents. A noble household has little room for the swooning and romanticism lesser peoples feel when hormones guide their actions, his mother had once said to him, explaining the politics of marriage. He knew such a fate undoubtedly lay in store for him as well. His father even agreed with her in this regard and was more adamant about it than she. What's the first rule of the house, the old duke would say ad nauseum, and Lita would have to repeat it word for word, never marry for love or it will bring our house down. And that reminded me of um, Dead and Lovely by Tom Waits, which has got the line, uh, don't let a fool kiss you, never marry for love. And also very cleverly in that song, he then flips it, so later he goes, don't let a kiss fool you, never marry for love. And uh, so Lita arrives on Ix, and um, I just want to read this whole section out, I think. Um, but there's interesting stuff here on like the subclass of workers that they have. As the capsule slid between the hanging stalactite buildings, Leto could make out ground cars, buses, and an aerial tube transport system. He felt as if he were inside a magical snowflake. Your buildings are incredibly beautiful, he said, his grey eyes drinking in all the details. I always thought of Ix as a noisy industrial world. We uh, foster that impression for outsiders. We've discovered structural materials that are not only aesthetically pleasing, but extremely light and strong. Living here underground, we're both protected and hidden. And it lets you keep the surface of the world in pristine condition, Leto pointed out. The Prince of Ix looked as if he hadn't even considered that advantage. The nobles and administrators live in the upper stalactite buildings, Romber continued. Workers, shift supervisors, and all the suboid crews live below in Warrens. Everyone works together for the prosperity of Ix. 
More levels beneath this city. People live even deeper down there. Well, not really people, they're suboids, Rombos said with a dismissive wave of one hand. We've specifically bred them to perform drudgery without complaint. Quite a triumph of genetic engineering. I don't know what we'd do without them. And to be honest, that just reminded me of how the upper classes in England look down upon the working classes. We get this um, great line. This is what's being taught to the, um, the crown prince who's going to become the emperor. Learning to manipulate people is an important part of ruling, Fenring often told him upon suggesting an idea. So later on, um, Kynes basically gets involved in a skirmish between the Harkonnen and the Fremen, because his idea is that by working with the Fremen, they can make like Dune more prosperous. Um, and he saves this guy's life, and uh, we learn that his name is Stilgar, which will be familiar to you if you've read the original books. We get a reference to the old philosophy of uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And um, here we discover basically what happens to people after they die. So um, when Torok finally led him through the guarded openings, past a door seal and into the siege proper, Kynes saw the place as a cave of infinite wonders. The aromas were dense, rich and redolent with humanity, smells of life, of a confined population, of manufacturing, cooking, carefully concealed wastes and even chemically exploited death. In a detached way, he confirmed his suspicion that the Fremen youths had not stolen the Harkonnen corpses for some sort of superstitious mutilation, but for the water in their bodies. Otherwise, it would have gone to waste. And then Kynes um, is presented to the leader of the Fremen, and he has this little back and forth with him. So, um, he says, My name is Pardo Kynes, planetologist to the Emperor. I have a vision, sir, a dream for you and your people, one I wish to share with all the Fremen, if only you will listen to me. Better to listen to the wind through a creosote bush than to waste time with the words of a fool, the siege leader responded. His words had a ponderous weight, as if this were an old and recognisable saying among his people. Kind stared back at the old man and quickly made up his own platitude, hoping to make an impression. And if one refuses to listen to words of truth and hope, who then is the greater fool? Um, one of the chapter heading quotes here from the Orange Catholic Bible. Blindness can take many forms other than the inability to see. Fanatics are often blinded in their thoughts. Leaders are often blinded in their hearts. Very true. And this is um, a confidential Ixian legal opinion. Well, what's interesting here is this is actually true for our own world as well. The leaders of the Butlerian Jihad did not adequately define artificial intelligence, failing to foresee all possibilities of an imaginative society. Therefore, we have substantial grey areas in which to manoeuvre. And I'm sure I've read somewhere that actually it's very difficult to define artificial intelligence and people, even in the cutting edge of AI, still don't quite know how to define AI. Alright, so here we get a quote from uh, Pardo Kynes. He's probably one of my favourite characters in this, I think. I mean, Duncan Idaho is great as well. But uh, anyway, Kynes, he said, uh, Religion and law among the masses must be one and the same. An act of disobedience must be a sin and require religious penalties. This will have the dual benefit of bringing both greater obedience and greater bravery. We must depend not so much on the bravery of individuals, you see, as upon the bravery of a whole population. And um, then we get this little bit with Stilgar as well, showing his respect for Kynes. So uh, it says, At first sight of his visitor, a lean Stilgar sat forward on his sickbed. Though his wound should have been fatal, the Fremen youth had almost entirely recovered in a short time. I owe you the water of my life, planetologist, he said, and with great seriousness spat upon the floor of the cave. Kynes was startled for a moment, then thought he understood. He knew the importance of water to these people, especially the precious moisture contained within a person's body. For Stilgar to sacrifice even a droplet of saliva showed him a great honour. And um, I don't know, I, in, the, in the original Dune, or at least the first few Dune books, um, one of the things I found most fascinating was the way that the cultures approached water. Uh, then we get like an assassin uh, who's got a Chris knife, uh, fashioned from the crystal tooth of a sandworm. Uh, and the thing with that is once it's been uh, unsheathed, it has to taste blood. And this one's been poisoned as well, so even just a nick tiny little bit, bit of blood, it would have enough poison on it to kill the person. But I couldn't help wondering, so it's saying it's made from the tooth of one of the worms, but when they killed the worm earlier, it all dissolved. And then basically Kynes just says to the assassin, remove yourself, and he, we get, he turned away and stared down at the knife he held in front of him. Then Uliot swayed, stopped, then swayed forward again deliberately and fell on his knife. His knees did not bend, nor did he flinch or try to avoid his fate as he let himself fall face first onto the floor, onto the tip of the blade. The poison Chris knife plunged below his sternum and up into his heart. Sprawled on the stone floor, his body trembled. Within moments, Juliet was dead. There was very little blood. So again, the uh, before sheathing, it has to taste blood. So he didn't want to carry out his mission and kill um, Kynes. 
so he killed himself instead. And I just thought this was interesting too um, about communication between these like huge distances involved. Since instantaneous fold space communication did not exist between planets, certified and bonded couriers booked passage on express highliners, bearing flash memorized communications for personal delivery to the intended recipients. The net result was much faster than radio or other electronic signals that would take years to cross fast space. And I just like this a little bit, so someone visits the Emperor, and we get, It is for the Emperor's ears only, she said, staring insolently at Hezban. Well, Elrude said, with a terse smile, I don't hear so well anymore, and this distinguished gentleman is my ears. Or should I say, are my ears? Does one use the plural in a situation like this? The Chamberlain bent over to whisper something to him. I'm informed that he is my ears, Elrude said with a decisive nod. A quote from the deathbed insights of Emperor Elrude the Ninth. Like many culinary delicacies, revenge is a dish best savoured slowly after long and delicate preparation. And a great quote here from Lady Helena Atreides' personal journal. So she wrote, Without a goal, a life is nothing. Sometimes the goal becomes a man's entire life, an all-consuming passion. But once that goal is achieved, what then? Oh, poor man, what then? And so on page 370, we get the first mention of the fear litany, the litany against fear, which I have tattooed or the first line of it on my arm there. I must not fear, fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total oblivion. I must face my fear. I will permit it to pass over and wash through me. And when it has passed, I will turn my inner eye to follow its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. Uh, and then we get a weapon called the Neuro Blade, and it is interesting, so I'm just gonna read this out. An interesting weapon, this Neuro Blade. Told you. It was the first time he had ever used one. Fenring always liked to test the important tools of his trade in non-combat situations, since he didn't want to be surprised in a crisis. Called a Ponta by its Richesian inventor, it was one of the few recent innovations Fenring considered worthwhile from that tiresome world. The illusionary green blade slid back into its compartment with a realistic snick. The victim had not only thought she was being stabbed to death, but through intense neurostimulation actually felt an attack powerful enough to kill. In a sense, Greer's own mind had killed her. And now there wasn't a mark on her skin. This here, uh, this is an imperial patent czar called Giancarna, and he says he has a the machine vaccine principle. Every technological device contains within it the tools of its opposite and of its own destruction, which I think is quite a cool idea. Um, and Kynes, the planetologist, he realizes that the worms are generating a lot of the oxygen um, that sustains life on June, which I thought was very cool. Answers kind of a question there, you know. And uh, he's also ordered a count of how many Fremen there are, and um, we get. Good, Kynes said, smiling. I need an approximate number so I can plan for our work. Then he waited expectantly. The young man looked up and stared at him directly with blue and blue eyes. The sieges are counted in excess of 500. Kynes drew a quick breath, far more than he had suspected. And the number of actual Fremen on June is approximately 10 million. Would you like me to compile the exact numbers, Emma Keynes? Keynes staggered backward with a gasp. Incredible. The Imperial estimates and the Harkonnen reports had implied mere hundreds of thousands, a million at the very most. And he realises he has his army that he needs to sort of terraform Dune and turn it into a watery paradise. Okay, then um, the technology of the Imperium 532nd edition, it says, History demonstrates that the advancement of technology is not a steady upward curve. There are flat periods, upward spurts, and even reversals. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, and also, <laughs> so Shaddam, who becomes the new emperor, um, he's basically involved in the plot to kill his father so he can, you know, take over the, his power. But we discover something quite disturbing that he'd been doing to his mother as well, so I'm just going to read this paragraph. The Emperor is dead, Yungar announced, tossing his long iron grey ponytail over his shoulder. Ah, yes. At least now he's at peace, Shadam said in a low husky voice, though a superstitious chill ran down his spine. Had Elrude known, at the very end, who had been responsible for his demise? Just before death, the ancient man's reptilian eyes had focused on his son. With a twisting in his gut, the crown prince remembered the terrible day when the emperor had discovered Shaddam's complicity in the murder of his elder son, Fafnir, and how the old man had chortled upon discovering that his younger child had been slipping contraceptives into the food of his own mother, Habla, so she couldn't conceive another son and rival to him. Jeez. We get uh, the line, it will be a cold day on Arrakis before that happens, which I like because that's obviously sort of a reflection of our human saying here in our world of uh, cold day in hell. Leto drinks a mug of mulled wine, um, which just made me smile because uh, my friend Sabrina loves mulled wine. She drinks it year round. So I, I bought her a bottle uh, when we had a jam at mine recently. And I had some mulled wine and quite enjoyed it, which I didn't know I did. Um, and then we just get, basically, I don't want to give too many spoilers, but Leto takes a big old risk and it kind of pays off. Um, 
and we get this quote at the start of one of the chapters. In the final analysis, the legendary event called Leto's Gambit became the basis of the young Duke Atreides' immense popularity. He successfully projected himself as a shining beacon of honour in a galactic sea of darkness. To many members of the Lion's Rad, Leto's honesty and naivete became a symbol of honour that shamed many of the great and minor houses to alter their behaviour toward each other, for a short time at least, until familiar old patterns re-emerged. So that's from Origins of the House of Atreides, Seeds of the Future in the Galactic Imperium by Bronzo of Ix. Um, but I was reading that as well and I thought, Leto's Gambit actually probably would have been a better title for this than House of Trades. So yeah, that's all I have to share with you from House of Trades by Brian Anderson, uh, by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. Uh, rating time, I gave this a solid four out of five. Um, probably one of, I mean, probably like top five Dune books so far. I felt as though with the original six Dune books, the first book was pretty good. And then books two to four were great. And then five and six kind of went downhill a bit. And then this one, I really enjoyed. It kind of actually rekindled my excitement to carry on reading June, which is good because I'd heard that these aren't very good. So, you know, I guess I disagree with that, at least for this book. Um, and I'm looking forward to the next one, which is presumably House Harkonnen, or there is another house book as well. Does it say anywhere? It doesn't say anywhere. Oh yeah. Don't miss the continuation of the stunning prequel to Frank Herbert's classic Dune, House Harkonnen, coming in October 2000. Well, I think I can wait until then. So there we have it, that's what I made of House of Trades by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.